back again, and today I'm looking at John 12, which uh, we had just looked at John 11, and we talked about preparation because the Pharisees and Sadducees, they're preparing because they're plotting against Jesus. They're plotting for his arrest and his death. And Jesus himself is preparing. He knows what's ahead. So he goes off by himself with his disciples into the wilderness and uh, away from Jerusalem where all the people are, are, where the word is out, you know, that they want to they wanna arrest him. Uh, so he goes off by himself. We looked at that last time. And how is he kind of preparing himself? Well, first of all, he's doing fellowship. He's with his disciples. And eventually, he comes a little closer to Jerusalem because now he's going to go to Bethany. And he's going to be with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, his other close friends. So he's doing that. He kind of, in a way, is making a little mini retreat before the ordeal that he has to go through. Maybe he's doing some last-minute teaching, too. I would guess that he's got a lot to tell these people before, and he knows he's only got a week left, you know? And he's thinking, let me get all this teaching in while I can. Not just teaching the multitudes like he has been doing, but teaching the disciples, because they are the ones then that are going to go out and start the early church. I mean, he knows what responsibility they're going to have for spreading the good news. So they are the ones that really need this specific teaching right now. So I'm thinking that was part of this thing of maybe going out into the wilderness. And of course it continues uh, during the time of the Last Supper and all of that. So, but we're going to go right now to Mary of Bethany, who is also doing some preparation. And she is going to prepare Jesus for his burial. It's almost prophetic how she knows that he's going to be buried soon. Uh, obviously she doesn't know it cognitively, but the spirit moves her to do this. So we're in uh, John 12, and it's six days before Passover right now. And remember, we said that uh, good Jews always, good Jewish men were required to go to Jerusalem for these festivals. And one of the festivals was the Passover. Um, and what's interesting about being in Bethany is it's only like two miles from Jerusalem. So it would have been a fairly easy walk. We heard this when we were talking about Lazarus because we, we know that the people came from Jerusalem to mourn with Mary and Martha when Lazarus died. So it's not really that far away, but it's far enough away that he's not with the Pharisees and Sadducees because he's at the house of Lazarus. So this is the first verse of John 12. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. So here the master has come, and they are so excited. I mean, don't forget, he raised Lazarus from the dead. So he's coming. They want to honor him. They're making a big celebration with close friends and family. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. And she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. I love this scene. I love to try to imagine myself in the corner of the room while the dinner is going on, and then Mary going off and getting this expensive perfume and coming around the table and finding Jesus, kneeling at his feet. When I looked up a bunch of things as far as this 12 ounce jar of expensive perfume made from nard. And I found that nard is also called spike nard and also sometimes called musk root. And it's an amber colored aromatic essential oil from a flowering plant in the family of honeysuckle. And it's only found in the Himalayas, it would have been grown in Nepal or China or India. So this would have had to be imported, an essential oil, and it was very costly because it, it, it was not something you could get, you know, in every store or grow yourself. So I, I found that interesting, an amber-colored, aromatic, essential oil from a flowering plant in the honeysuckle family. It made me think of my grandmother because at my grandmother's house, there was a honeysuckle uh, bush that was out in front of her home when I was growing up. 
And whenever I would go to her house and that thing was in bloom, you could smell it for yards and yards away, you know. And it was just such a gorgeous uh, fragrance, one that was unlike anything else. So this would have been something that, that they treasured, okay? And um, of course at that time they did use spices and fragrances to embalm the dead. So when uh, Mary uses this, she anoints him. And this word anoint also kind of, uh, it kind of intrigues me. I'm thinking, where did I hear that word anointed? And what would it be used for? And I found a, um, a couple of different places, one of which was 1 Samuel. And I'm going to look that up because I thought it was so interesting that 1 Samuel 16 and uh, this is when, no, it's before that, because this is when um, Samuel would, oh, I'm looking in 2 Samuel, that's what the problem is. You know, it's 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, and I was in the wrong book. No wonder it didn't look right to me. Okay, there we go. Okay, this is when Samuel, the prophet, anoints David as king. And he says, um, he sends him to, to this home, the home of David. And when he arrived, uh, Samuel looked at Eliahab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Okay, he's looking at one of David's brothers. Okay, David was out in the field. He wasn't anywhere to be found, but all of the other older brothers were there. And the Lord said to Samuel, this verse 7, Don't judge by his appearance in, or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Uh, so later on, they send for David to come. And the Lord said to Samuel, this is the one, anoint him. So David stood there among his brothers and Samuel took the flask of olive oil that he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. So this kind of anointing, any kind of anointing really, is a ceremony that's performed to uh, confer an honor on someone, okay? And also, obviously in this case would have been used for burial, um, but also when you, when you anoint someone, you ceremonially rub oil into them as a way of honoring them, honoring them as the king. Now, Mary would have been honoring Jesus as Messiah. She would have been saying with this uh, beautiful uh, gesture, she would have been saying, Lord, I believe you are king. Lord, I believe you are Messiah. And she took something very personal, her hair, and she wiped his feet with her hair. That is complete humility and servitude. And it is saying, you are worthy of my worship. And that's what Samuel was saying when he anointed David. You are chosen of God. And remember David, of course, was a model or a type of Jesus. He was an arrow pointing to Jesus, the king who was a great king, but still not perfect as Jesus is perfect. So of the line of David came the final perfect king. But they were both anointed, okay? And Mary was the one who anointed Jesus in this ceremony that she made. Now what I found to be interesting about this is that here the Lord is saying to Samuel, don't judge by appearance or height for I have rejected this one, this son. I, I don't want him for my king. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. Um, he said, then, um, I lost my place here. The Lord doesn't judge things the way you see them. The, uh, by outward appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. Okay, so listen to the very next sentence now in the, in the ceremony, right after Mary does her thing with the nard, Okay. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. 
not that he cared for the poor, because he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Here again, God knows what's in his heart. Okay? And obviously it was revealed later in his actions that he's trying to make it seem like he cares about the poor. You know, this, this nard, why is she wasting it on you? You know, you could have sold that. All that money could be given to the poor. Not that he really would have given that to the poor. He would have taken some graft off the top for himself. You know, the Lord doesn't judge by outward appearances. He knows your heart, and that's what he cares about. It isn't, I mean, I wonder, well, wonder in our own lives, you know, how many people we know that have done these magnanimous things of, you know, giving money to the poor and whatever, but it isn't really about actions, is it? It's really about the heart, and only God knows why a person is that way. Maybe their heart is in the right place, and they really are kind and generous, or maybe they're doing it for fame or a tax write-off, you know, and we just don't know. We aren't, as human beings, we aren't to judge that. It's not for us to judge. That is for the Lord to judge. All we can really go on is actions, you know. But at least we can try not to judge people by their outer appearance. Because this is what God is saying. That's not important. It's not important. And here, uh, Jesus gives him quite an answer about why it wasn't important to sell that. This is verse 7. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This isn't Jesus saying that we don't care about poor people at all. First of all, he knows what's going on in Judas's heart. He knows that money wouldn't have gone to the poor people anyway, so that's not the point, you know. But beyond that, he's saying there is something unbelievably important going on here. I'm going to die for the world. And that is more important than anything that's happening on earth right now. And Mary obviously was, was used by the Holy Spirit to perform this anointing as a symbol of recognizing that Jesus was king, that he was Messiah, and also in preparation for his burial, even though she didn't even know that. She could not possibly have known that he was going to die and be buried. But God gave her this incentive, this feeling that she should go anoint him and, and dry his hair with her, or dry his feet with her hair um, as a gesture pointing towards the fact that he will be buried. He will die. So what's interesting about this also is that Mark tells us the same story. And it's in uh, Mark 14, verses like 4 to 9. And uh, here's what it says in Mark about the same thing. Uh, Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste, waste such expensive perfume? Um, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. Okay, this gives us a little more information. First of all, it tells us that that jar of nard would have cost as much as a man could make in an entire year. Think about that. Think about it in today's economy. Let's say, um, let's say somebody makes $40,000 a year. Okay, or fifty thousand dollars. It was a fifty thousand dollar jar of perfume. That that that's really costly. That's not just expensive. That's like unbelievable extravagance, you know. But that's the thing. God's love is extravagant. How extravagant is it to be willing to die for the world? That's as extravagant as it gets. So really, what's a forty thousand dollar? jar of perfume you know when you compare it to that but anyway let's go back to mark here um so they they scolded her harshly i i find that interesting too that they went after her and said what are you doing there you know it wasn't just that they made a fuss in front of jesus they actually went after her and said hey what are you doing that for you know they scolded her you you're silly you're foolish why are you wasting that you know to her it wasn't a waste but to them it seemed wasteful 
And so it continues here in Mark. It says, Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing for me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. That is, means that Mary of Bethany was immortalized by her act. It means that people talked about it, people remembered it, and they put it together after his death and resurrection, after Jesus had died and, and resurrected. They said, hey, remember that Mary? What a good thing she did. You know, she anointed him for burial even before he was buried. You know, her deed was immortalized. I love it. I think it's great. So watch what happens afterwards. When all the people heard Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man that Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, this is the thing. Jesus was famous. And so as soon as they heard he was at Lazarus' house again, a bunch of people went to see him. It's also true, though, that they wanted to see Lazarus. If you knew somebody that rose from the dead, wouldn't you want to see him in real life? And just, you know, wow, there's the, you know, he's a celebrity, right? Of course, I'm thinking the priest didn't like this. Verse 30. No, verse 10, sorry. Then the leading priests decided to kill Lazarus, too. So, not only did they not believe what had happened, but they said, not only are we going to kill Jesus, we're going to get Lazarus too. Verse 11, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Not only kill Jesus, but let's kill all the witnesses. That's, that's the point here, right? If we could get rid of the proof, we could get rid of this guy who supposedly was raised from the dead, right? And why do they want to do that? Because people were leaving them and flocking to Jesus. Jealousy, greed, worrying about their own power and position. This is why their hearts were not open to understand what Jesus was teaching and to accept the grace and love that, that he was offering them. It's really sad, very sad. I'm going to stop there because um, the next part of this goes on with the uh, entrance into Jerusalem. And, uh, of course, we celebrate that a lot on Palm Sunday. And uh, we're going to be talking about that. I think I'll talk about that. And how I, I don't know. Maybe I'll get some ideas when I read it. <laughs> For now, I just read this, this section of, of John 12 because... I think it's a very meaningful section. And it's now the end of this preparation. He's prepared for burial. And where is he going now? Jerusalem. And uh, the only thing left now is to um, be with his disciples at the Last Supper, do that preparation, that teaching, and he'll be praying. And all of that will lead up to this ordeal that he knows is coming. So... Thank you for joining me today, and uh, I don't know, just have a good day today, I guess, and just remember the love of Jesus is so extravagant. Have a good day.